Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Affilian webinar today. Uh, we're going to wait for a couple more people to, to join in. We see a couple people are coming in. That's great. Matthew, Miguel, how are you guys doing today? How's 2022 going so far? Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty busy. Yeah, uh, pretty busy. Pretty, pretty snowy. It finally started snowing in Denver, so winter has officially arrived. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm in LA, so I don't get the luxury of the. <laughs> uh, get, you don't get snow or rain. Yeah, well, I, it's been raining a good amount. I think the last two weeks were, were just all rain. No, yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Awesome. So let's see, we got a couple people joining. Give it another minute or so. Sure, and there's a little. A little filler for time, uh, everyone is joining. In our first webinar, we were together presenting, uh, but thanks to the current uh, COVID situation, we are doing the responsible thing and socially distancing for this webinar. Yeah, it's, it's crazy how it is right now. It's, you know, every time we think we're in the green, it's, it's just going, we're just going backwards. It's an interesting time for sure. Yeah. Well, yep. <laughs> awesome. So I think we can go ahead and uh, get started. We, we have a good amount of people joining. Okay. Uh, yeah, so so overall, how was, you know, you know, let me first introduce myself. Sorry about that. I'm Khalil. I'm the uh, content marketing manager here at DNA. And yeah, I'm here helping uh, the affiliate team with their crowdfunding raise and and show everyone what um, they're all about. Uh, Miguel, Matthew, do you guys want to give a little introduction to yourselves um, for the for the potential investors and the new investors? Sure, uh, sure. sure. I, can, right I can start. Sure. Uh, my name is Miguel Ayala. I'm the CEO of Affiliate Aerospace. I've been in the aerospace industry my entire career, which is over 20 years in, uh, involved in the design, uh, in the development of um, uh, uh, fighter jets, um, launch vehicles like missiles, rockets, spacecraft, um, like satellites, space stations. Um, some of the projects that have been involved in, thing in the past include the, the, um, the space shuttle, the International Space Station, uh, the, um, the Lockheed Martin uh, F-35 fighter jets, the SpaceX Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy rockets, Dragon spacecraft at Lockheed Martin. I was actually uh, on the, uh, I worked on the Orion spacecraft and the 821 satellites. Recently, uh, I was involved in the Vulcan rocket development at ULA, also the um, SLS rocket um, development through ULA, uh, supporting Boeing. And, um, and after all of that, here I am leading um, the field in aerospace, uh, another uh, integrated launch and um, uh, spacecraft company here. Awesome. Wonderful, and I am Matthew Travis, founder and CEO of Aphelion Aerospace. I'm glad to be here with Miguel today to talk about our company. And uh, I got my start in aerospace way back in the 1990s on a couple of small satellite and suborbital rocket projects. Uh, in 2000, I moved down to Florida to work at Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center. Uh, I worked uh, for subcontracting with the Space Shuttle Program, Space Station, the NASA Launch Services Program. Uh, I rode out the Space Shuttle Program to its end, and I bridged my time after the Space Shuttle retirement doing a lot of media work for the news media which gave me exposure and experience both behind and in front of the camera. Uh, and in 2015 and into 2016, uh, the original founding team of Aphelion, a group of young engineers, uh, reached out to me initially as an advisory role. And as the company solidified and our business plan came together, uh, we incorporated with uh, me as the president and COO. That was in 2017, and we have been progressing since then on our dedicated nanosatellite launch system, green propulsion, and uh, nanosatellite and CubeSat products and services. Awesome. 
Yeah, 2021 might have, must have been a really big year for you guys, you know, the, the launch of the campaign. Um, I know you went through a whole rebranding phase. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about 2021. How How was that for you? Sure. Uh, so in 2021, um, Matthew and I, well, actually, Matthew and I started working together towards the end of 2020. Uh, so then when I joined the company back in the in the later part of 2020, um, during 2021, during, during the first half of the year, Matthew and I were uh, pretty much um, uh, re restructuring, rebranding the company, um, him, him working remotely out of Vegas, um, at me here in Denver. We were uh, trying to you know, put, um, look at everything, look at the financials, look at the um, the, the, next, the five year picture, the three year picture, the one year picture, the uh, six month picture, and uh, so within six months we, um, we 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 put together a solid plan to make things happen. And so then over the summer we signed. Um, um, and this is while there's the pandemic going on and our facility is uh, is literally, literally closed uh, without access out in New Jersey. <laughs> So, so that while while that was happening, we were you know um, making making planning to move the company, relocate the company from New Jersey to to Denver, from uh, Union City, New Jersey to to Denver, and, um, and that's what we did over the summer. Uh, we we did um, three things. Um, we started um, the um, this equity crowdfunding campaign. We started preparing for it over the summer. We at the same time we we started finalizing our lease for our, for our new uh, new larger R and D facility here in Denver. At the same time, we hired um, uh, we brought on three additional people to our team, so um, so we could have um, you know more support. Actually, three uh, three full time people and uh, two consultants. So we hired five people in total um, over the summer, and and then. Um, then, as we um, as we started moving the company, uh, as we started moving um, you know people and um, equipment to Denver, we started uh, preparing for our uh, rocket engine test um, that uh, is uh, scheduled to take place this month, later this month. And um, um, yeah, we've been pretty busy. So, so relocating, uh, also. Um, Fundraising through Start Engine, we launched our campaign in uh, like on the last day of October, I believe. So it's been three months essentially. I think you know October, November, uh, December. It was like the end of um, September. I think. So it's been three months um, uh, running our campaign. On top of that, we've been fundraising from traditional accredited investors um, in parallel, and that's been um, going pretty well as well. And uh, at the same time, we've been um, filling up. Um, we're, we've been beefing up uh, our um, advisory board with uh, some heavy hitters from the um, from the DoD and NASA and commercial world. So we are very proud to have the people that we have on our board now, and um, they're, they're they're helping us to, um, with our outreach to the government side and the commercial side, and we're strengthening our network. And um, we've also been approaching our customers and sending more letters of intent, more more uh, contracts, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to say that we've we've been very active. Um, engaging with our customers and we do have like right now we are actively working on contracts um, um, and we expect to be receiving uh, uh, revenue this quarter also we have uh, over 100 million dollars in letters of intent that's for future contracts and it's for launch services it's for um, uh, satellites um, i mean for cubesats and it's also for um, in, in space propulsion systems so we've been yeah, pretty active, pretty much setting the um, setting the foundation to scale. Yes, and I, I'd like to uh, piggyback on Miguel's comments uh, and mention that our newest set of rocket engine hardware has been manufactured and it is in our facility now, uh, ready for testing this month. So that phase has been completed and our data acquisition and control system is at the present time it is being checked out in our workshop downstairs from where Miguel and I are. Um, and just as a, a, a quick side note, all of this that we've done this year with the rebranding, relocation, uh, replanning, um, in, in a way it actually had its uh, 
inception, the impetus because of the pandemic last year and Miguel and I trying to figure out, okay, how can we move forward now given the circumstances that we're in? So in a way, you know, the silver lining to the pandemic is um, the fact that I feel in aerospace is still alive and it is here in Denver and growing. Awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yep. Why, why the rebrand, you know, and uh, why the relocation? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the original name of the company was Affiliate Orbitals, okay? And uh, under that name, the company went from, um, it, it, it operated from 2017 to 20, um, Matthew, I think it was like 2018 towards the end. Yes. Okay. So, um, so then, um, then Matthew uh, um, took over, and uh, essentially um, uh, conti continued the work of that original company, Affiliate Orbitals. And then he called the new company Phoenix Launch Systems back in, um, uh, back in, um, in, in 2019. So then once Matthew and I started working together, collaborating, um, we, were, we were realizing that, um, that we should um, do our best to keep the legacy of the original team you know, uh, by by name and by uh, um, intellectual property and by vision. So we went we went back to using the name of Aphelion, going back for, to that name. Um, also, because Aphelion is actually more is is more unique than Phoenix. Phoenix, man, there like there are thousands of things called Phoenix. <laughs> so we wanted to just be more unique, and I, we didn't see that many things called Aphelion. So we went back to the original name because it's unique and it ties us to the original team. Also, um, uh, we we didn't want to use the word orbitals uh, because it implies just orbital applications. It also, and then we we didn't want to use uh, launch systems because it implies that we're just a launch company. Um, uh, and so then we went with aerospace because uh, we have products not only for space launch, but we have products for uh, in space applications like you know little little satellites, propulsion systems, and. Um, we also have uh, products that are applicable for the aviation industry. But at this point, because we're such a small team, we're not focusing on that right now. We, we, there's only so much we can do. So eventually down the road when we're established, um, we have um, uh, a huge, a huge, huge growth, growth potential in the aviation industry, which we don't want to talk too much about right now. It's just too early. But later on, you'll be happy that you will have invested in this company. <laughs> There's a ton of growth. <laughs> and, and, and on a personal note, uh, since I was deeply involved with that feeling orbitals, um, I personally always uh, have had a fondness for the, the branding that we created. So um, I think the day that I saw that there was another company in Europe named Phoenix Space Systems, it kind of told me we need to do some rebranding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I've I've been the, um, with you guys to to you know from the uh, foundation of the of the planning of the campaign to to actually seeing the campaign live now and and the growth from just that from you know end of twenty twenty to to now has has been phenomenal. Um, yeah, thank and you. I, thank you. Of course. Um, and you know, go ahead for everyone who's viewing right now. Please leave any questions um, in the chat box below, and we'll be more than happy to answer it throughout the webinar. Uh, Miguel, Matthew. Mm -hmm. So you know, we talked about 2021. Um, what's next? What's 2022 looking like? What's the roadmap ahead? Okay, uh, you know, it, so to um, to start with that question, if you, if you don't mind, I could present. Um, yeah, you know, the pitch deck that we typically present to investors, yeah. and it'll give it'll give uh, people you know the, the the long not only 2022 but also the vision for the next three to five years, and then we can um, focus more on 2022. What what are the milestones that we need to hit to make this whole this whole stuff um, all this stuff happen? Yeah, let's so, do it. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, one second. Let's see. Let me know when you can uh, actually. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. I see your background. Okay. There All we right. go. Can, can you see that? Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay, so for those who are just joining today, and in case you don't understand um, 
you don't know much about their company. Um, and, as, and let's say maybe you don't, um, you don't know too familiar with CubeSats, uh, we'll, we'll go start, we'll, we'll start with there. So, uh, so here's the thing. Let's say that uh, you have a little package. Let's say you, are, you go to UPS, for example, UPS FedEx or just the postal service, and you wanna send, a, you wanna ship this little package to the other side of the world. And uh, what if I told you that it was gonna cost you way more to um, ship that package than what it cost you to build it? And that's, that's the problem that we're trying to solve with, uh, with nanosatellites, with these little CubeSats. Yeah, these little CubeSats, they, they're really, um, here's the thing, here's, here's a little CubeSat, for example. Like, uh, one cube, one unit cube is only 10 cubic centimeters. Like, it's like the size of a Rubik's cube. And you, you can stack them together. Uh, in, in different forms to make larger and sa larger satellites. Yeah, you, you can make a satellite out of one unit and then you can make larger satellites with more capabilities with the different applications. Um, and um, these are, this is a simple architecture, really easy to, to design, to build. Um, you can build it with off the shelf parts. However, this is the problem. <clears throat> so it, it costs on average four times more um, to launch this CubeSat than to build the CubeSat itself. And um, it gets worse in certain situations. And it, 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 the problem is not, this, uh, it's not uh, the same for larger satellites. Like really large satellites are really expensive. They're in billions of dollars. So the launch is a small fraction of the total cost for big, uh, big satellites. The other problem is this. When it comes to space launch, it takes anywhere between one to six years to go from contract to launch of a satellite. And um, when you have a little CubeSat that only has a, an average lifespan of like three to five years, <laughs> imagine waiting six years to, la to launch this CubeSat and then it has to float in space for several months before it's in operation. And then you only have it up there for like three, three years, three to five years. In, in, in a lot of um, uh, situations, the, uh, that CubeSat only lives like a few months or like depending on the, um, on the application, depending on what the, what's, what the CubeSat do, is doing, it could just be a few months. So that, the whole process is just, it's, it's just not practical. So, because, because the reason is that uh, over time, as we uh, are seeing, technology is um, uh, quickly advancing. And by the time you launch your CubeSat up into space, you, the software program that you have on your CubeSat is outdated. And many things on that keeps it not only software are outdated, so that's that's um, that's a, that's a big problem, and uh, this is where we come in. We are the single point of contact for the end customer. We help the end customer from beginning to end. We help them uh, design and uh, uh, integrate their CubeSat using off-the-shelf parts uh, with our global industry partners. We have in partners around the world that helps us with different pieces of uh, what we need to do. Also, we, we provide the launch services and the relaunch ser uh, services very rapidly. Uh, and, we, uh, and we also help them with the mission operations so that in the end, um, the, um, the customer receives a turnkey service a, tur a turkey, um, a turkey um, um, a a bit of access to their to their cube set. Uh, we essentially work like a like a foreman and a construction team. Uh, we handle the the whole the, the whole project, and then we hand off the keys once the cube set is in operation. And so the way we do this is with uh, responsive operations, dedicated launch vehicles, and high launch cadence. Uh, and this way. The benefit to the customer is we are able to reduce the launch process from well, uh, from one to six years to initially less than a month, and then eventually for some of those more routine launches to less than a week. And uh, see, routine launches, like we have to be careful about what routine launch means, because right now it doesn't exist. There's no such a thing as a routine launch, uh, space launch. Every launch is custom. Every time the, the whole process is different and it's just crazy ridiculous. <laughs> so, so we're trying to just you know, streamline that whole thing as much as possible. And, and, and then the truth is that the, the industry is moving that way anyway. At the FAA, uh, um, they are you know, making that, uh, they're helping us make the routine launch to space uh, 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 possible. And we are jumping on it and we're trying to be the first ones that can actually make that happen. And um, this is how we do this, with this little rocket, 
instead of uh, building huge, huge rockets that operate kind of like big buses uh, to launch lots of cube sets of space, we are building little little rockets that kind of like operate like taxis for door to door service for, for just a few uh, cube sets for like one to a few cube sets at a time. However, we can launch from other places around the world, and um, we can access um, reach multiple locations uh, on orbit because orbit is not one destination. Orbit is this giant sphere um, uh, above Earth, so there are many many locations to to, to go to. And so then, uh, we um, again our, our little rocket is designed for manufacture, easily accessible. We don't need the crazy lifting devices to get around it. Uh, we are using our non proprietary I mean, sorry, our, our proprietary green propulsion technology. I'll go into details about that in, in, later on. And then we're using um, automated operations as much as possible. We're trying to remove the, the human in the loop as much as possible to to just streamline the whole launch process and um, you know move quickly. Now, and this is how we intend to operate. We intend to have, um, you know, hangars at spaceports around the world, and we need to. We intend to have multiple little rockets uh, ready for launch because our uh, our propellants are storable. We don't need to fuel the rocket right before launch. We can have them, have them, we can keep them ready, pre-fueled, and then we can uh, put them on a on a trailer truck um, configuration and uh, launch. Um, uh, you go go from rollout to launch within an hour, and th and then we go back and repeat. And th there are we have uh, we tend to reuse the first stage and be able to um, you know launch again within a, within a couple of days within a few days. So that's that's how we intend to keep this process fast and um, you know, and affordable. And um, we're not just focusing on launch because we know like we've been. We've been told time and time and again, uh, aerospace is um, um, capital intensive and long term to revenue and um, you know, all of that. So then what we said is, you know what, how about this? Like, since we're gonna be building um, um, CubeSats anyway for our customers, why don't we just have our basic platform of CubeSats that we can make available, that we can have available for our customers? And that's what we have. We have uh, right now in the market, we have um, our our CubeSat platforms already for sale. We're, we're currently in, 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 in contract, uh, 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 working on contracts to start selling our CubeSats because they're already developed. Uh, this is for early revenue. We're talking about revenue within this quarter. And then um, as we progress, as we, um, you know, um, optimize our proportion technology, we will have, we plan to have our propulsion uh, systems for launch and for space for larger satellites uh, ready, fully developed and ready for market within a few months uh, the, in, in 2022. Uh, that is the part, that is the purpose of our fundraising. And then eventually as we you know, generate funds from, um, I mean, as we generate revenue from those two sources, CubeSat sales and propulsion uh, systems uh, sales, we will use that revenue and, of course, additional funding uh, to continue developing the launch vehicles, um, suborbital first, and then eventually orbital vehicles. And uh, this is the the market that we're after. So right, right here, um, we are going after the uh, the CubeSat market, which uh, includes um, nanosats, and microsats, and even picosat, like a variety of little satellites that we can uh, uh, that we can support with parts and services and uh, all kinds of things. And then uh, when it comes to the propulsion, we're talking about uh, the entire chemical propulsion uh, market for launch vehicles, for spacecraft, essentially our propulsion technology can do anything that hydrogen based propulsion can do. And then when it, uh, then we have the, um, the space launch market and that's uh, satellites, not only satellites, but also uh, any sort of research um, uh, that, that's happening in space. One of the things that's happening, re uh, that's growing right now is uh, in, uh, in space um, uh, uh, services, there's um, uh, orbital cleanup, and there's also um, in, in space manufacturing, uh, there are companies developing manufacturing facilities in orbit. And, and commercial stations, and, and you know what, we can service a lot of those markets. Yeah, some with some modifications, but uh, especially the CubeSat market for the CubeSat market for the satellite market. Um, that's what that's going to be our our bread bread and butter. 
uh, when it comes to launch, but then there are all these different uh, markets that um, that we can tap into with very with minor modifications. Uh, in total, the current market about twenty billion dollars, and by twenty thirty, about ninety billion dollars. And uh, as you can see, the that the green line there that's the number of of uh, satellites launched per year. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, I looked at. Um, uh, more um, market data that includes uh, other other satellite uh, launches, and um, yeah, that number in 2030 it's more like double that. We could be looking at like 3,000 um, satellite launches per year. Uh, the reason why I didn't include that bigger number is because that bigger number includes constellations. Uh, when it comes to launching big constellations, uh, that may not be. Um, that's where you need a bus, you know, a big, a big rocket that carries hundreds of satellites. However, when it comes to servicing that constellation, that's where we come in. And then when it comes to like uh, in space propulsion for those uh, satellites, that's where we come in. And, um, and then this is how we uh, differentiate ourselves from the leading um, launch companies uh, here in the US. And they're actually leading, leading at, the, at the world level too. Um, we are, uh, we are using, we are the only ones using eco-friendly, non-toxic, non-cryogenic propulsion. And, um, you know, people might be thinking, well, what, what the hell does that do? <laughs> what, what, what's the difference? Well, this is the difference. This is how we are different. If you look at the, um, the left uh, column there, <clears throat> um, you, um, you, when you look at the, bl the black bars, uh, currently, with uh, Virgin Orbit and Rocket Lab, you may be able to launch your your satellite, your CubeSat, within 12 months, within a year. However, it's going to cost you a pretty penny, between thirty-seven to forty thousand dollars per kilogram. Now, uh, you may um, people tell us all the time, "Hey, look, SpaceX—they uh, are the cheapest. They, nobody can beat them. They're, they're unbeatable," uh, which is partially true. However, with SpaceX. Now, you may be able to pay five thousand dollars per, per, per kilogram. However, you're gonna have to wait up two years to be able to launch your CubeSat. So you have to you have to play that in your in your development schedule, uh, and um, you know that may be uh, okay to wait for some people, some companies. Uh, however, if you if you are uh, managing a uh, if you're if you're a constellation uh, company and you need to uh, have the capability to replace certain cube sets that went uh, bad uh, often. Uh, two years that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's too long to wait. If you are a new entrant to the, to the industry and you want to start generating revenue quickly, two years is too long. If you are the, the, uh, the government, if you are the military, if you, if, you are, if you have defense applications for your satellites and you need to address, address a threat uh, immediately, well, two years are certainly not too long to wait. It's too long to wait. So that's where we come in, you know, a, 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 a cost-effective, uh, uh, quick launch to, um, I mean, contract to launch. That's that's uh, that's where we, where we, um, um, where, how how uh, we're able to. Um, that's what we're able to offer, uh, thanks to um, the way we, um, uh, thanks to our a small vehicle, thanks to um, our propulsion technology being non-toxic, non cryogenic non because the most difficult piece of um, uh, of uh, launching a rocket is the propulsion system. Yeah, we've been we've been using cryogenics and toxic propellants since the beginning of the space age, since the 1950s and 60s. We haven't changed that. Like right now, over 90% of launch vehicles, actually almost 100% of all the launch vehicles, still use cryogenics and toxics. And you, you remove cryogenics and toxics out of the picture, and launch becomes so much simpler, so much more, more affordable and faster. And this is um, our marketing market strategy. Right now, to be able to uh, start generating revenue as soon, as soon as possible, we have our CubeSat uh, products already in the market. That's the orange box up in the top there. And then um, you know, that, that um, our CubeSat, uh, we, we intend to um, expand um, our reach into the CubeSat uh, um, market. And there are, we are, we're seeing opportunities in the telecom, IoT, uh, earth imagery, um, areas, so there are different applications for our cube sets, and then we have other cube sets um, that um, that um, there's also there's other uh, cube set technology that we're licensing NASA, uh, and then 
while we are doing that, um, at the same time, we are continue, uh, continuing to develop our launch vehicles and our propulsion systems. That's uh, through um, R&D grants, uh, launch contracts, and, and also mm -hmm. joint partnerships with other new space companies that see the value in, uh, in what we offer. And this is us. We are leaders. We're veterans of NASA, Air Force, and top aerospace companies. And Matthew, over, uh, he has over 30 years uh, developing, um, building, putting together, integrating launch vehicles, uh, spacecraft, mostly on the software and propulsion side. And myself, uh, over 20 years uh, working for high profile uh, you know, space programs um, at Lockheed, SpaceX, uh, and other companies that I mentioned earlier. And then me, mostly on the propulsion and the structure side. And then we have Freddie, our builder. He has been, um, you know, he was, he was a, um, uh, he worked in um, uh, putting together the F-16 um, fighter jets. And uh, then um, that was at the Air Force, then at SpaceX, um, um, uh, building, putting together the, uh, the propulsion systems of the rockets, the Falcon 9 uh, rockets and the Dragon spacecraft. And then at Blue Origin, he was responsible for putting together the, the, the engines for, um, for the New Shepard. Uh, in fact, uh, his name is uh, engraved on the, the propulsion system that carried Jeff Bezos to space. It's a, he's, he's our, you know, our, our builder. And um, this, these are our board advisors. We have um, the person on the NASA side who is responsible for the success of SpaceX is Edward Mango. And he is with, uh, he's one of our board advisors. He is a proponent of commercial launch, commercial um, commercial space, basically. So he's, uh, he's, he's helping us uh, quite a bit. And then we have Kevin Rice. He is the, uh, um, he was the former uh, business management director at J NASA JPL and Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. And he's working with us, he's uh, guiding us. And then Jeff um, Brem, he, uh, he has, um, he was, he's the former VP of uh, Deutsche Telekom. Deutsche Telekom is a, is a huge uh, company. Uh, it's the parent company of, um, of T-Mobile and uh, he's helping us uh, penetrate the, the telecom, the, um, the, data, the data science uh, market. And this is our uh, history. Uh, basically, um, the company back in 2016, uh, we um, we built and tested a, a green propulsion thruster, and then in 2017, the company as, as affiliate Orbitals raised the 500,000 in pre-seed, and then in 2018, tested a full-scale rocket engine. In 2019, we um, we incorporated uh, as uh, well. Um, we covered it as a Phoenix Launch Systems, but uh, we changed the name to Helium Aerospace. So it's just a name change there. And then in 2020, we've been um, pretty much building, uh, solidifying our partnerships uh, with uh, with DOD, with NASA, with uh, commercial companies, um, and uh, then in 2021, that's when we moved here to the Denver. And I'm happy to say that we have uh, over 100 million dollars in letters of intent uh, from from um, customers. And then we have um, we are currently selling CubeSats already. And this is um, our capital strategy. Uh, so far, we have um, uh, spent. We have uh, we have committed. Um, um, our own personal funds and the founded thousand dollars in VC funding um, to a total of $1.6 million for all the work that we're doing right now. And we started selling cubes that's last year in 2021. And then our goal for 2022 is right here. Uh, we need to finish um, our propulsion system qualification for both for launch vehicles and spacecraft. And, um, and then uh, we intend to use the, the 1.07 million that we're raising through Star Engine, and then the 2 million that we're raising through a regular um, you know, round from um, accredited investors. We intend to use that funding to finish our propulsion system development and also start selling uh, propulsion systems for, for spacecraft and uh, for uh, launch vehicles. And then uh, we're looking at the, the raising a series uh, A later this year so that we can start using those funds uh, either later this year or in 2023 uh, to start um, um, preparing for um, suborbital launches by 2023 and orbital launches by 2024. And, uh, and then eventually at the, by 2024, we can start looking at, uh, we'll, have, um, we'll be looking at the um, exit options. So one of the exit options is uh, the uh, Series B uh, later round uh, where we raise $100 million or, or perhaps more. And um, this is uh, um, pretty much the ask. Like I said earlier, we've already committed, we've already uh, uh, 
invested uh, 1.6 million dollars into the company now we're raising a total of 3.1 million uh, 1.1 million 1.07 million through start engine rec cf 2 million through um through a regular uh, investment round and um these are the um I, I, we, I just talked about this, like all the different um, re, uh, things that we need to do, we need to accomplish in 2022. In 2022, we need, uh, we need to continue selling um, our CubeSats. We need to finish our launch vehicle propulsion system and also uh, our spacecraft propulsion development. And um, that's what the funding is for. And then uh, when we race, after we race the Series A uh, later next this year, actually, uh, we will be uh, ready for. Um, we will be positioning our, ourselves for an uh, for an early exit within uh, three to five years, uh, with um, with a minimum valuation of uh, one billion dollars. Uh, again, either to do a Series B or M and A, or a, or a SPAC, depending on what make what makes the best sense. Uh, or if if we uh, keep doing going well, and you know we we, we choose Series B and we keep uh, moving forward, then we could be looking at uh, an IPO within the eight to 10 years uh, with a 10 billion plus uh, valuation. And right now, um, for example, some of our competitors like Astra, Firefly, ABL, in, uh, Space Systems, Virgin Orbit, uh, they are all um, worth in the billions of dollars. Relativity, like a rocket lab, they're all in, in, the, in, the, in the billions of dollars. And then, uh, 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 where we came up with this $10 billion valuation is because if you look at companies that are, have been around for more than um, more than eight to 10 years in, in our industry, yeah, they're definitely in the tens of billions. Like right now, uh, SpaceX has been around for 20 years and SpaceX, it looks like it's, uh, it's valued at um, $100 billion and uh, other companies um, in, are in that range. They're in the $50, $60 billion range. And um, it's, um, so that's what we see. And then, this is uh, essentially um, uh, S. This is a plane aerospace. We are raising three three point one million dollars in total right now. We do have over hundred million dollars in uh, letters of intent from customers. Uh, we have a proprietary um, CubeSat uh, IP, and we are filing for patents for for our propulsion technology. And, uh, and then we're we're licensing um, is, is several NASA technologies uh, or NASA and DoD technologies. And we have a ton of potential for um, non dilutive funding from, from NASA, from, from the NSF, the National Science Foundation, and uh, DOD. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your time here. And please, uh, any questions that you have, um, as, uh, you know, let us know right now while we're here, while we have the rest of, I guess we have 20 minutes still. So <laughs> ask away. Yeah. So uh, I would like, may, uh, may I make a couple quick points, real quick? Um, sure. Uh, First, uh, with uh, Kevin Rice, our advisor, I think it's good to note that he was brought on board uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, after uh, several high profile interplanetary Mars missions led by JPL failed. He was brought on board and completely reorganized their operations. And since then, there has been no failures of the JPL mission. So that experience is valuable to us. And um, we get asked about SpaceX, how we can, how we can compete uh, constantly. That's like the metric apparently. Um, for SpaceX's CubeSat rideshare program, yes, there is a $5,000 per kilogram pricing, but there's a minimum $1 million price. If you go to the SpaceX website and get a quote to launch your CubeSat, whether it's one kilogram or 200 kilograms, you'll be charged $1 million. We are very, very uh, competitive against that type of pricing. Mm -hmm. And also, when it comes to ride share, uh, when it when it comes to ride share launch of uh, larger satellites, uh, the ones that are currently hydrazine uh, propulsion powered, well, uh, we have the best green, like environmentally friendly alternative to anything hydrazine based. So when it comes to building these, these large constellations of satellites that are larger than, than CubeSats, with them, our propulsion technology is, is, is a great, um, um, is a, is a great um, way for them to be environmentally friendly and also low 
cost and more responsive and all of that good stuff. And um, we do have um, we, we do have multiple large satellite uh, manufacturers coming to us um, asking when our propulsion system is going to be ready. In fact, we have a letter of support from a major satellite company uh, that's uh, that's offered us a, a free launch to space to qualify our our propulsion technology in space so that um, if everything goes well, we have the opportunity to become their main propulsion system provider. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Thank you, Matthew. Oh. Thank you, Miguel. Um, I see that we have a question from Luis. Uh, what prefab cubist uh, type is already available? Uh, can you say that again? What prefab Cubist uh, types are already available. Oh, currently one uh, U and three U, and uh, by the end of the first half of 2022, we will have six U and larger uh, form factors available, as well as um, the ability to provide custom uh, configurations for our customers. Thank you, Luis, for your question. I hope that answers what you were looking for. Uh, another question I see from Anonymous. Um, were there any weaknesses that, you've, um, that you saw in 2021? And if so, what are your plans in 2022 to, to solve those weaknesses? Uh, Miguel can address uh, things on the, the corporate side fundraising is always difficult. Um, mm -hmm. On the engineering and operations side of things, uh, I don't know if you would call it a weakness or a challenge, but the supply chain uh, this year uh, has been very, very challenging to work with, with extremely long delivery timelines, pricing that is not reliable, and certain systems and components that we rely on, we're now paying up to four times the, the price that we would have paid two years ago. And that's been difficult to work around, especially when we're trying to manage our, our, uh, our budgeting and, and, and timetables. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, could you repeat, repeat the question so that I uh, yeah. have it clearly clear? So what? Sure. Uh, I can basically uh, simplify it. What challenges did you run into in 2021 and what are your plans in 2022 to overcome those challenges? Oh, okay, so, um, so in 2021, um, the, our biggest challenge, I would say having uh, limited funds. Limited, limited, well, that was our biggest challenge. The, the, like, it's crazy. Um, money can solve a lot of things. <laughs> so, so we had to be really careful about how we use our, our, our funds. And um, it was just, it was a challenge. We, we, could, uh, we couldn't move, like we could have moved way faster than we we're fighting, moving now. We're, we're moving fast now, but we could have moved even faster. Um, and um, we, we had to be careful. We had to be careful about how we spend our money, what things we can do, who we can hire and what we can purchase. And, and then with what with Matthew with what Matthew mentioned with the supply chain challenges, whoa, it was um, uh, you know with that already like with the pandemic already having a, a being a big factor and on top of that uh, being careful about how we're spending our funds, it, it, it has been very challenging. So <clears throat> that and then also um, other challenges uh, we uh, we were working remotely for um, half of um, uh, 2021, so we could. So we couldn't really do that much stuff when we when there's a lot of um, you know teamwork, um, team uh, team dynamics, development, strengthening um, that need to be um, that need to be um, um, uh, worked on, and also when there's a lot of hand work, a lot of hand um, handy work, a lot of manual labor um, uh, involved. Uh, there's only so much you can do when you're working remotely. So so once we uh, once we all moved in. To our facility uh, here in um, in Lakewood, I think in the last three months we have made more progress than in the last year. <laughs> before. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, so we we could just like it's so easy to be able to just look over and be like, "Hey, Matthew, what do you think about this?" Just 
immediate, you know. So, so there are there, there are definitely pros and cons to working. Uh, I mean, there are definitely some major pro, pros in um, when it comes to working together, uh, physically together. So, yeah, that that was one of the things. Another thing is um, is um, ha not having uh, a uh, yeah, a team that um, not not having all the skills in the team. You know, uh, we have some. We have brilliant people in the team. We have, I'm very proud of the, the team that we are building right now. We have some amazing people in the team. However, again, because we are working with a limited budget, not having certain expertise immediately and having to reach out to consultants and having to figure out what, um, how to solve certain things, it, um, that, that also got in the way. So, so this is part of the reason why we're, we're fundraising. Right now, uh, with, uh, with, this, uh, with the funding from Start Engine and, and with funding uh, from our um, regular crowd, I mean, with our um, from funding with funding from our regular um, Reg D um, accredited investor round, with all of that, we should be able to. Uh, we we plan to uh, double the headcount. And right now we're about ten people. We we plan to grow to about twenty people within six months, and then by the end of uh, twenty twenty two, by the end of the year, we should be at about thirty people. And um, with that, we should be able to grow even more, even, even faster, and uh, and uh, we should be able to, um, you know, est establish a strong foundation for continued growth. Definitely, yes. Yeah, staffing is, I should have mentioned that as well. Trying to do a lot of things, but knowing that you really wish you had more people to help you do all of those things, uh, that also has presented extreme challenges for us. Yeah. Yeah. We are we're all wearing so many hats. Unbelievable! <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's exciting, but at the same time, it is just wow. Do you see my eyes? Look, I'm sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then another question from anonymous: um, What motivates you guys? Oh Matthew, gosh! Go, go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Matthew, and then I'll go next. Um, you know, I was I'm a late Apollo child. So I don't really remember the moon landings, but I remember first seeing the space shuttle. I remember watching Skylab, the first spa first American space station, uh, the crews being launched to there when I was a kid. And, you know, when you're three years old, uh, that's pretty impressive. And, and, and I grew up in basically a small town in the Midwest where, you know, the idea of success was you go to high school, get your blue collar job and you stick with it for 30 years and then retire on your pension, but you, but you never really do much. And I always felt restless. There's gotta be more, there has to be more, there has to be more. And always, I, I always had this focus on space flight, uh, you know, as that something more. Uh, and it's, it's really evolved since then. And uh, basically it became part of my DNA. It's not really what I do. It's just, it's who I am. So what motivates me is the fact that I wake up in the morning and I breathe and then I am who I am and it's time to get to work. Miguel. Well, for me, uh, I, um, so I was, um, I was born in the, um, in a small village in the Andes mountains of Peru at uh, 10,000 feet above sea level, uh, in, in, in this very remote place. And, um, and when I was little, when I was there, I remember you know, like walking around in the middle of the night and looking up, um, my God, you can see the entire Milky Way. It is so bright up there. You, you like right now, in a, when you're in the middle of Denver, when, you, in a, when you're in the middle of the city, you're lucky to see a few stars up there. But well, from where I was born, you could see just the, the sky, just bright, full of stars, full of just so many things up there. And that first inspired me to, to want to build um, you know, spaceships and rockets that, that would go to space. And with that, uh, you know, with that dream, I moved to Lima, Peru, the capital, and that's where I learned about uh, about um, rocket uh, about rocket science and. Um, the space shuttle, and and then I learned that um, uh, the place to be was here in the U.S. Uh, you know, so that's why I moved. I, I begged my family to, to bring me to the U.S. 
to um, so that I could pursue aerospace engineering and uh, uh, be a rocket scientist. And I also wanted to be an astronaut growing up. Eventually, I guess that 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 dream changed, <laughs> but uh, but I continued to want to be a rocket scientist. Uh, and as I learned more, I also uh, uh, what what, um, what I saw also is that uh, in, in Peru, for example, I was I wasn't in the Amazon, but I was in the mountains, and I saw. Uh, the impact that mining had in the environment, you know, um, the, these big holes and the, um, in, in the in beautiful uh, places around them, um, in, you know, in the middle of um, the, um, the Peru. And then, and then when I learned about, um, when I saw what, what the, the impact of like f fossil fuels um, in, the, in the environment, I, I just thought, okay, you know what, there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way for us. Uh, and that's when, um, I, uh, I started looking at um, different ways of um, of powering uh, rockets, for example. You know, uh, you know that, that, like for example, cars. You know, we are we are using electricity to power cars, and um, and then um, the, there's um, like we there are literally giant blocks of precious metals just floating up in space. We don't have to be mining uh, on our from our planet uh, and depleting all the resources. So. Yeah. There are other options. Same with fossil fuels. There are so there are so many ways of um, of powering um, of of uh, extracting energy resources, and uh, that's what in inspired me to to work on a company like this. That's um, that's that's, um, that's that's working on uh, being able to power rockets using non toxic, non cryogenic, like non fossil fuel derived um, uh, chemicals uh, for propulsion. And then what I what I want to do is really expand uh, the, um, uh, the access of, um, access to space to be able to um, use uh, utilize what space has uh, for us. Like right now, the resources on on, on Earth. Are finite, you know. We are they're limited. We're going to be running out of um, certain things pretty soon. Uh, however, in space, there's just so much, so much potential in space. All we need to do is get up there and um, collect all that, uh, all, all that, <laughs> all, all those minerals. You know, it's a, yeah. It, 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 I think I'm excited. I'm excited about what the future holds for us in space. But. Um... With 10 minutes left here, uh, 10 minutes or less, uh, can you give a quick rundown on, you know, quick summary on the goals for, for 2022 and, and what you guys sure. um, plan on accomplishing? Sure. Absolutely. Miguel, you want me to talk about some of the hardware and project yeah. stuff? Mm -hmm. Go okay. For it. Go for it. So first off, uh, as Miguel mentioned, uh, we are targeting this month for our next round of Rocket engine propulsion system hot fire testing. These are ground tests at our partner Frontier Astronautics facility up in Chugwater, Wyoming. We're really excited about this and hopefully we'll get some good photo and video for all of our investors just so they can see how the money's being spent. Um, concurrent with that, we are licensing, uh, as you see on this slide, some critical technologies from NASA and the Air Force. This will enable us to retire significant risk with both our launch system as well as our nano satellite uh, products. Uh, and that's what will enable us to be on market with our larger nano satellites, our more capable nano satellites, uh, hopefully by the uh, middle of this year, if not sooner. Again, some of that is funding dependent. Um, and then uh, by the end of this year, uh, we will be, uh, we should have gone through the critical design review of the launch vehicle. That's where the design is finalized and we can start actually building the hardware. And then also in the propulsion system qualification and certification phase so that we could then be uh, eligible to start bidding on NASA launch contracts. And with that, I'll hand it over to Miguel. Yeah, so, so uh, in the... In we have a lot of things to do to accomplish in the, in the next um, year. Right now, um, uh, like Matthew mentioned, in this, uh, yeah, we have the rocket engine test in this uh, first um, month of the year. But uh, however, we, um, I mean, in addition to that, we, we we are in the middle of due diligence right now with uh, with an investment firm, and we have um, between ten to fifteen uh, follower following accredited investors. Uh, so we should be able to. Um, uh, 
We're targeting closing our, our seed round of the $2 million seed round by the end of this month. Uh, it may extend into, um, into, into February, uh, but I would see that based on um, the traction that we're getting right now, we should be able to close our seed round no later than the end of um, March, if, if yeah, assuming there are some delays here and there. And um, that's when um, the, the, our campaign, our, our, our crowdfunding campaign, it also runs till, till March. So by the end of March, we should, uh, have the two million dollars uh, from um, accredited investors, and uh, we um, we hope that um, seeing that we have you know accredited investors investing in us, it gives uh, the general public more confidence to invest in us through Start Engine, and we're hoping that we can still reach our target of a million dollars by the end of March. So then, with, with the three million dollars that we would have in total, uh, we would um, we continue moving forward. Uh, we we have in case. You know, certain things um, don't work out. We do have other funds available. Uh, we we are, we are going to be receiving um, um, revenue. We're going to we're going to be, we're going to be um, uh, starting to receive general uh, revenue from this uh, in this first quarter from um, from sales of um, of uh, cube sets, from sales of um, uh, of um, uh, different uh, hardware. So we will have revenue also. Uh, we have um, we have a sister company that provides engineering services, and we use revenue and uh, working capital uh, from that company to fund what we're doing. So, uh, to basically to reduce our uh, capital risk as much as possible, and um, and then uh, we we intend to um, to finish the um, the the uh, the qualification of our propulsion systems for both for launch and for and for space in space uh, applications later this uh, this year um, and at the same time af after we fundraise after we're successful if uh, fundraising our seed round and the uh, crowdfunding we intend to uh, revalue the company yeah, immediately and then uh, start uh, raising our series a which we hope to be um, be done with by the summer or maybe at the fall of this year, uh, and that's um, and that, that's the that's going to be a big round, a much bigger round uh, with a much higher valuation of the company because we're looking at the as you see on this. I'm not sure you can still if you can see still see my screen. Uh, the current valuation of the company is eight million, and um, I I know this sounds like a like a sleazy salesman, <laughs> but I will say that that value is severely undervalued that that's that's a valuation that we came up with like six months ago and um, even then it was at least like 50 percent undervalued and uh, since then we've made a ton of progress so i wouldn't be surprised if right now the current valuation is more like 50 million or something uh, so yeah, that's why we're, we're we're seeing that uh, after 18 months of uh raising this uh, you know, uh 18 months from now essentially uh, we should be at um, easily at a hundred plus million dollar valuation. Uh, we, there are many examples of that. If uh, you know, our investors, they're, they're more than welcome to, to look at other companies that are at that level, like uh, Stoke Space, uh, Phantom Space, uh, Bayer Space, Exos Aerospace. Uh, look at any of those companies and they are worth in, in hundreds of millions, maybe not Phantom yet, but maybe I don't know, and then um, and then if you look at uh, if you look, when you look at other companies uh, that are even more advanced, um, maybe like three to five years uh, ahead of us, uh, those would be the Astra, the Firefly, the Rocket Lab, the Relativity, Virgin Orbit. Those are worth in the billions. So so these are not um, you know um, pipe dreams. <laughs> We're looking at the actual uh, um, you know you know research based uh, est estimates. Yes, I mean, what it comes down to in the end is if we do our job as a company and meet our milestones and develop our technologies, our valuation will go up similarly to these other companies. Uh, so these are not numbers that we pulled out of thin air or you know, <laughs> re reached up in the sky to grab a couple pies to, to throw on a pitch deck. These are actual, real, reachable numbers mm -hmm. yeah uh, yeah and they're also based on actual um estimates on um, how many launches we could provide per year 
how many um, in space proportion modules we could sell per year, how many CubeSats we could sell per year, per month. Uh, we've, we've, we've been looking at this for a long time and um, we, we understand this industry pretty well. We're not, you know, like, um, we're not offering, we're not promising like 500 launches a year by 2025, <laughs> nothing like that. No, no. We want to grow rapidly, but sustainably and predictably. Yeah. So I think that that wraps our time today. Uh, Miguel, Matthew, uh, thank you guys so much for, for today. Uh, for, for, you know, all the new investors or potential investors, how can they get a hold of you? Um, where can they go to get more information? Uh, yes. Uh, so please, uh, first of all, thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. Yes. This, is, this, this really means a lot to us. Uh, it, it's great. Uh, I appreciate your support and your interest. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, you are, you're welcome to reach out to us um, at uh, info at affiliateaerospace.com. We'll receive it. Any of us will we'll, we'll receive it and respond to you quickly. And, and also, you can um, please follow us on, um, on link. You can find us on LinkedIn, on, uh, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube. We have a YouTube channel where we show stuff. Uh, we, are, we are trying to be active online as much as possible. We have our website. Uh, we, you, can, you can post, uh, I think I think you have the ability to even qu post questions on our website. I think you can join our, our newsletter on our website. You can sign up to, on, um, on our, uh, through our website for the Start Engine campaign. If you don't have the link, if you don't have the direct link to Start Engine, you can do that too. Um, yeah, there are many ways uh, of um, reaching out to us. We all have uh, our LinkedIn uh, profiles and Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Um, yeah, we're easily accessible. Yes, yeah, you, you, you can find the company and all of our principals, Miguel, Freddie, and myself on, on LinkedIn, on our respective social media channels, and please do uh, visit our website as well as as well as the Start Engine campaign page, of course. Uh, and yeah, if, any questions, please feel free to reach out. Yeah, absolutely. Start, the Start Engine page is a great tool, tool to stay updated with uh, Affiliate Aerospace. So if you haven't seen the the Start Engine race page, uh, go ahead and do that. And you know they update it week to week. Um, it's always going to be updated, always with the the new um, traction in the company and, and, and to stay updated. Yes, um, I, rec I recommend going there first. Yeah, and that, yeah, and, yeah that, that, that website is uh, startengine.com uh, forward slash affiliate dash aerospace. Yes. And it'll take you right there to the to our starting page. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the webinar today and uh, uh, be on the lookout for the copy of this uh, event uh it's been recording so so uh, in the coming days we'll be sending out uh the the recap all right sounds good have a good one everybody. thanks thanks very much everybody thank you so it's much it's been great Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot.